I'm excited to be here with everyone today and share some of my experiences as a leader. Hopefully you can learn from my mistakes and, and trust me, I've made uh, many along the way. I've uh, been fascinated really by the intersection of cognitive psychology and how it relates with technology and leadership ever since I was introduced to the concept about six years ago by Chris Sanders. And uh, I try to incorporate many of those principles and understanding of different cognitive biases into uh, my work and how I lead teams. And I'd like to share some of that with all of you today. I want to thank you also for taking the time uh, to be here. I think it's a testament and shows a level of dedication and deliberate practice for, for trying to improve ourselves, which is a hallmark of great leadership. It's something that we'll touch upon. So I applaud all of you for that. Uh, this is my first time delivering this presentation, so please bear with me uh, if it seems a bit disjointed or verbo verbose. Uh, we'll try to distill it within the time allotted. So let's move on to the first slide. So you've already been introduced to me. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd rather not talk about myself, uh, but I'd be more than happy to connect with, with all of you on LinkedIn and we can continue the discussion. So let's jump in and get started. I've got a picture of three animals here and uh, I'd like to you to guess, and you can post it in the Slack channel, what animals you think these are. So why don't you go ahead and do that. Let me check the Slack channel. Any, any guesses, any ideas, what do you see? All right, all right, that's good. So some folks are seeing different things, a seal, a swan, a penguin, uh, and others are seeing different animals, which is interesting. So the reality is, and I think someone got it right, so congratulations, uh, I believe it was Dominic, it's actually a doe, an elephant, and a giraffe, and they were flipped upside down, and it was taken from a Jeep ad in France, see what you want, whatever you want to see, and it, this resonated with me because it, it allowed me to see that our perspective, the lens which with we see things, changes everything. And sometimes we can flip our ideas and conventional wisdom when it comes to uh, how we lead teams, how we motivate. And that's really what I want to jump into in this conversation here. It's let's flip our thinking about leadership. Let's look at some of these questions here that I'd like us to think about, and that is how are the highest performing teams really motivated? What motivates them? Uh, is it the conventional carrot stick model of reward and punishment? And then how does that, does that change during lean times? And uh, rock stars, we've heard so much about rocks, rock star talent. Is that really the key to sustain success? And are we looking at the right qualities when hiring and developing talent? And uh, as you can see here, these bats actually look pretty cool when you flip them upside down, even though they're hanging upside down there. So let's go on to the next slide. Frameworks. I love frameworks. And McKenzie 7S framework, which was developed by McKenzie consultants decades ago, but has stood the test of time, can help really uh, uh, give us an understanding of our organizations and uh, improve performance and also implement strategies. It consists of seven components. They all begin with a letter S to make it easy to remember. And they're broken up into hard factors and soft factors. The hard factors are relatively easy to identify and influence as managers. The soft factors are a little bit more difficult. They're less tangible and they're more influenced by the company culture. So that's really what I'm going to focus on in this discussion here is the soft factors uh, but we can get into the hard factors in, in another conversation. But quick tip here is that this framework, even though organizations use it for digital transformations, for example, it can be used uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. And Todd Fitzgerald actually wrote a book called The CISO Compass, which uh, brought it to my attention. And I recommend uh, it's recommended reading for all of you. And the tip that I have for you is this framework can be used to understand and how to best integrate new mergers and acquisitions. So if you've ever dealt with a new acquisition, you understand the difficulties of trying 
to take that separate uh, organization that has its own culture and its own structure and its own systems and style and integrate it into our own cybersecurity program and controls. So we're going to loosely use this framework in the discussion because I think it's helpful. So let's, let's dive in and look at some definitions. What is a high performing team? Uh, I thought about this for a while, I, I, and I think this definition is probably something that most of us can agree with. Right? A group of people with a shared common vision, they have goals, they collaborate, they challenge, they hold each other accountable to achieve sustained maximum results. And when I, when I initially uh, put this together, I had sustained optimal uh, or, or maximum was the term that I use, uh, not maximum, but uh, uh, high level result was what I had uh, initially. And it's really about maximizing potential. And I, and I ultimately changed it. And it's about creating a team that is greater than the sum of its indiv individual components. And that's what this equation is referencing. Two plus three should be greater than five, right? That's how I define a high-performing team. And this discussion is not just dealing with high-performing teams, but also during difficult times, lean times. And I think we could all agree that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the uh, economy, inflation. If you look at the chart over here, this was taken from the Q1 earnings reports for the S&P 1200. And these were the top terms that, that came up over and over and over again. Uh, recession, cost inflation, headwinds, uh, wage inflation. These are all things that are top of mind for organizations during their earnings recall earnings call rather, and it's an indication that we're living in uncertain uh, economic conditions. And that makes it challenging for us as leaders. And as a matter of fact, 70% of companies don't regain their pre-recession growth levels in the three years following a recession. So this might be something that stays with us, hopefully not, but it might, and we need to be able to deal with that dynamic going forward. So does change energize us? Uh, this is an interesting concept. I worked at uh, an organization where we had posters all over the building and it said change energizes us. And that was something that they really were trying to push in terms of the culture that change is inevitable and we need to embrace it and it should energize us. But the actual, in actuality, it can kind of suck the energy out of us and result in change fatigue which is this negative employee response to change. It results in burnout, sometimes apathy and frustration. It's, it's driven by uncertainty and volatility and results in less sustainable performance and lower levels of trust. So this is something that I would recommend that you, you sit down and discuss with your teams. You know, how are you dealing with change? A lot of times as leaders, we don't realize that we're, sometimes responsible for these constant shifting priorities and it and the effect and impact that it has on the teams that we're leading. So I would recommend sitting down, having that discussion and trying to understand, are we dealing with change fatigue and how can, how can we as leaders improve the conditions for the folks on our team? So I wanna talk about my cat. It wouldn't be a discussion here if uh, we didn't have a pet on one of these slides. So here's a picture of uh, Gus. He is uh, lying on his back with his belly exposed. Does anyone know what that is an indication of? Just post it in the Slack channel. When a cat does that, what does that mean? Trust, exactly. So this is an indication that Gus, and he was my daughter named him after Gus, Gus and Cinderella. He, he, uh, he trusts us. There's an implicit trust. And He's comfortable and he feels safe. He feels safe around us and in front of us. Now, my cats are indoor cats and I sometimes allow them outside. I see them staring. If you have cats, you see them staring outside and just yearning for the outdoors. And uh, it makes me want to give that to them. So I do let them out every now and then. And Gus got really excited one day and decided to climb up and into the bottom of our deck. And you can see the picture of him here. And yes, he got stuck, but I, 
quickly realized that and I didn't know what to do. And I looked around and I, I saw I had a ladder. So I grabbed the ladder and I went outside and I went to go get him. So I put the ladder up and I went to grab him and he just was bearing down. He, he was scared and he did not want to let me pick him up in that instance. So I was thinking about it and I didn't know what to do. So I, I got down from the ladder and I repositioned it and I went back up and I decided what I'm going to do is just lean close to Gus and give him my, you know, show him my shoulder. And I did that and I waited a few minutes and finally one paw and then the second paw and then he went on top of my shoulder and I was able to bring him down. And it really gave me some insight in that moment. And sometimes life throws metaphors at us that, uh, that gives us insight. And that's what I saw here was that we might have individuals and teams that, that traditionally feel safe and, and trusted, but during uncertainty, times of uncertainty and fear require extra patience and understanding and creativity. And that was something that I learned in this instance that I wanted to share with you. So what is the cost of bad leadership? I think many of us are familiar, we've experienced and maybe even ourselves uh, weren't initially great leaders, but ultimately there's an impact to that. And it's, it's, it impacts trust. 57% of employees do not trust their organization's leaders to act in their best interests. And there's a cost ultimately to attrition and turnover. And there's a figure here that says it costs the company roughly six to nine months of an employee salary to replace them. So we want to we want to understand this dynamic as leaders because employees ultimately join companies, but they typically leave managers. And we've heard this time and again, over 57% of unhappy employees leave an organization and job because of their boss or manager. And 71% are actually willing to accept a pay cut for the right cultural fit, which is very interesting. And I'm sure it resonates with some of us on this call. So what can we do? One of the things that I've learned about that I've tried to instill, instill in myself and in my teams is this idea of a growth mindset. And Dr. Carol Dweck uh, came up with this based on uh, studies uh, and case studies done with individuals where they were given very challenging problems. They were given problems that were really beyond their, their capacity to solve. And she noticed that there are two mindsets. There was this fixed mindset that led to, I'm not, you know, I, I'm smart enough, I should know this. And they got bored and disinterested. And there was another group of individuals and, and intelligence levels were the same amongst all of them. So it wasn't an intelligence thing, it was the mindset. There were others that when they, when they saw these difficult problems, they perked up and they got excited. And they wanted to learn more and they, they embraced the challenge and, and they had this growth mindset and it allowed them to persist in the face of setbacks, uh, to see an effort as a path to mastery and, and ultimately to want to learn from feedback and find inspiration in the success of others. So that is something that we as leaders should try to instill in ourselves and then also the teams that we lead. So there is this concept that uh, called the Pygmalion effect that I've always uh, kept top of mind because it indicates that performance can be positively or negatively influenced by the expectations of others. And what they did was they told a teacher in a classroom that these are your gifted students. And the teacher essentially went on to treat them as if they were gifted. Now the catch is they weren't. They just randomly selected these students and told the teacher that they were gifted. And ultimately what happened was these students ended up being the highest performers because the teacher treated them as if they were gifted and they in turn saw themselves in a different light and it allowed them to excel and become uh, better and, and perform better than, than they thought they could. And that's something that's always resonated with me and something that I want to remind myself and, and all of you is that we need to 
lift the expectations that we have for our teams and not necessarily look at conventional wisdom and, and talent and how talent should be developed. And that's something we're going to get into. So let's see potential in, in the people that we lead, right? This is really important. If you, you know, when we treat people merely as they are, they will remain that way. And when we treat them how they could be, they will become what they could be. And a great example of that is this individual here who was drafted 199th overall in the 2000 NFL draft. He was skinny. He was slow. He didn't have that traditional talent that quarterbacks had. And ultimately, 198 picks gave up on him. And he wasn't, he, he, he wasn't even the starting quarterback for the vast majority of the year at the University of Michigan. And the reason why is because they had another quarterback. I believe his name was Drew Henson. And he had traditional talent. He had a strong arm. He was big. He was fast. He actually was a great athlete. He played baseball where to the point where he was probably going to get drafted to play baseball. So the coach was kind of in a pickle and didn't know what to do. He, he had this, this traditionally talented quarterback that had all the signs of being a great quarterback. And then he had this skinny, uh, slow quarterback, but he had all these in, intangibles and his name was Tom Brady. And ultimately he was not drafted high because the, these teams in the NFL figured if his own coach didn't believe in, in him, why should we? So I want to, I want to emphasize the fact that we need to see potential in people and look for the different qualities that are not traditional talent markers. And that's the tip that we have here at the bottom is uh, really, really care, look for folks that care about what they're doing, that have a pride in whatever they're doing and not necessarily come into the job with passion, but create that passion themselves and invest in them and even if they don't display these typical signs of potential, like raw intelligence and uh, communication skills and, and, and things that we typically are the markers for success. So something else that I came across uh, that I wanted to share with all of you today was there was a journalist who wanted to do some research on the, the, the teams, the greatest teams in, in the history uh, of sports and what was what was it that made them successful and it, it, it initially started off as an article but became a book because there, there, there was so much research that went into it and his name was Sam Walker and he was able to still distill it uh, down to about 16 teams and these 16 teams had sustained success they were dynasties they just didn't win the championship once or a few championships, they had sustained success. And what did what made them great? And I want you to try to guess uh, what made them great. Was it uh, the great coach, perhaps? Was the owner fantastic? Did they have a, a general manager that was like Billy Bean from Moneyball, just metrics and on top of everything? Was it rock star talent uh, or an unlimited budget? or a great fan base, like what, what was it that made them great? And ultimately what Sam Walker found out was they had all exceptional captains. Now, what's interesting about this, if you look at the list of these captains, they don't ring out, they don't stand out as being great players necessarily with great talent. Like for example, you've got Various, and this was across various sports and countries. It wasn't limited to the U.S. or certain sports. It was football. It was uh, baseball with the New York Yankees. It was rugby with the New Zealand All Blacks, basketball, uh, handball in France. And they found, uh, he found, Sam Walker found that there was the consistent thread amongst all these great teams was they had an exceptional captain. But the captain did not, wasn't necessarily the most talented player on these teams. So what talents do you think they had? Take some guesses. Here they are. 
So they all had these qualities in common. And, and I recommend the book. It's called The Captain Class by Sam Walker. It started off as a sports book, but has been embraced by the business community as a, as a uh, insightful for leadership. And I recommend it for all of you. But these were essentially the qualities that, uh, yeah, these were essentially the qualities that made them stand out. And I want to go in into, I'm not going to cover, we don't have enough time to really go into each of them, but some of them I think are more applicable than others to what we're trying to achieve in terms of high performing teams in the business world. So let's dive in. Tenacity and focus. They, these individuals, these captains, they rarely were the most talented, but they had this tireless commitment to perform at their highest potential. And that that, that involved conditioning and preparation. And there's this concept called social loafing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a phenomenon where people tend to exert less effort to achieve a goal when they're working in a group uh, as opposed to working alone. And the antidote to social loafing is when there's one person in that group that's giving 100%. And these captains did that. They gave 100%. And that rubbed off on the rest of the team and elevated everyone. So tenacity and focus was one of the key traits. The other one was that they lead, they led from the back. They shunned attention. They, they did not care about how they were perceived by the outside world. And they remained entirely focused on internal dynamics of the team. And I love this quote by Nelson Mandela, who I consider to be one of the greatest leaders of all time. And he states here, a leader is like a shepherd. They stay behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they are being directed from behind. And these captains, they led in that way from behind. Another trait that I want to talk about, well, let me give an example of Carla Overbeck before we go to the next uh, trait. She was the captain of the U.S. women's soccer team. And here's a quote from her where she says, I never cared about getting my name in the paper. As long as the team won, I was happy. I didn't care about TV shows. I was actually happy that they didn't ask me to do interviews. So this is an example of someone who had that type of uh, humility and, and didn't really, that shunned attention. And the next time, what I recommend, you know, the tip here is next time you interview a candidate, screen for these, these qualities, these intangibles, positive attitude, can-do attitude, humility, and uh, work ethic. They were vocal. So again, the interesting part and the interesting point here is that they were not motivational speakers. They didn't give that, that speech at halftime that you see in the movies. And uh, they were often inarticulate, but they were consistently vocal and they listened as much as they spoke. And this you know, Tim Duncan is was one of those captains and you see the picture of him giving instructions to a teammate and his coach uh, describing him. He didn't judge people. He tried to figure out who they were, what they do, and what their strengths were. He was just very, he had a very good sense about people. And that's really what these captains did. They fostered a culture of communication. So leaders, I, I, I like this quote, leaders who don't listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. And uh, if you've ever seen this, uh, there's a very interesting and funny video about the, it's not about the nail, I recommend you Google it. I don't have time to go into it. But essentially, when uh, the tip here is when seeking your team's feedback, don't give your opinion first. Uh, and and it because it's going to ultimately uh, influence the advice that you get. So try to try to withhold that. The other quality that these these captains had was they challenged the status quo. So even though they might have had that quiet uh, <clears throat> communication style, an individual communication style, they did not uh, feel shy when it came to speaking truth to those in power, even if it felt uncomfortable. They did it because they knew it was for the benefit of the team. They avoided groupthink. And uh, to me, this it reminded me of a book called Radical Candor that I also recommend by Kim Scott, where she talks about the qualities of the most effective leaders and managers is that they care personally and challenge directly. And the thing that 
I always try to remember is that the absence of conflict isn't always harmony. It's often apathy. And that we want to focus on attacking the problem and not the individual pe people. So one of the, the tips that I, that I try to remember for myself here is to encourage debate, not just encourage debate on my team, but reward it. Let them know that they should, that it's not only okay to push back, but they should in order to uh, avoid path dependency. And that's when we, we're, all, we're on a path and we think that we should stay on it because this is the path that we've always been on. But these leaders, these captains, they challenge that. And that's something that we should emphasize with our teams. One thing I wanted to also mention was that high performing teams have a diversity of culture. And I think some folks brought that up in the Slack channel and it's spot on. And when it comes to culture, we're talking about diversity of thought, backgrounds, experience. And I, I, I wanna prove this to you with an example. So I had given a talk several years ago about inattentional blindness. And I gave this example where you had to count the number of Fs in the sentence. I don't know if you've seen this before, but go ahead, try to count the number of Fs. You'll, most people don't, don't get them all. They miss some, right? Ultimately, there's 13 total and most folks will count about 11 because of the Fs in the, the word of. It's not a hard F sound. It sounds more like a V. So that cognitive shortcut that we use during scanning of words will miss these Fs. So I um, I had someone on the team that I hired who was high functioning uh, autis autistic and he was super sharp, very smart individual. And I asked him to count the number of Fs in this example. And he got it right every time he was spot on. And when I told him that most people miss some of the Fs, he was like, really? He could not fathom how anyone can get it wrong because to him, he was always doing a character by character scan. And it made me realize that uh, neurodivergent employees have and bring a sense of depth and creativeness to our teams and that allows them to perform at a high level. And not only that, the animals that I showed you at the beginning, I actually showed my wife the same uh, animals and I asked her, you know, what are they? And these, these were the animals upside down. And she saw them right side up, which is interesting because she's dyslexic and she's also an artist. So I don't know if it was a right brain versus left brain thing or the fact that she was dyslexic, but she was able to see the animals uh, even though they were upside down, the actual real animals. So that really proves to me that diversity and neurodiversity is so important for high performing teams. The other thing that I came across that I've been trying to implement in uh, the teams that I lead that I think might be helpful is this self-determination theory. And that was created by Ryan and Desi and Daniel Pink in his book, Drive, really goes in depth on this concept of what motivates individuals and humans. And that's really a, they strive for growth and internal sources of motivation. And that allows them to achieve this through three main components. And what Daniel Pink found and something that I've been able to also see in my own teams is that if you can give your employees and the teams that you lead these three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, even they will, they will function at a high level and they will stay with the organization, even if they're not making the most money because they're, they're not really driven by these external sources of mo motivation. They want a sense of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And I want to go in over each of these in a little bit more detail. So autonomy, very important. Individual contributors uh, or managers, they need a sense of autonomy in how they perform their work. And the best leaders give, the, give it to them, right? People want to feel in control, not control. So the tip here is resist the urge to jump in and save the day. I know a lot, a lot of leaders and managers, they're, they're sharp, they're intelligent people, they have a lot of experience and they want to they be helpful, but sometimes you're not really letting uh, that growth set in through, through, through uh, failure sometimes for the individuals on your team. So let them know and feel that with failure comes growth and give them that space 
to achieve it. Uh, part of aut autonomy is, is not drowning out the voice of the folks on your team. And this is something that I learned from Liz Wiseman's book, Multipliers, and she was actually an Oracle uh, executive that, uh, that wrote this book. And she emphasizes the need to ensure that our voice as leaders is not diminishing the voice of our teams. And there's a quiz that you can take that I recommend. It's called the Accidental Diminisher. And, and I'm not ashamed to say that I, I scored uh, uh, as an accidental diminisher. And I'm sure most, some of us uh, will as well, because we don't realize it. We want to be helpful. We want to jump in and help. And we need to realize that sometimes our voice uh, drowns out the voice of our teams. And I always think of Nelson Mandela when he was asked, you know, what made you a great leader? And he said, my father. And they said, well, what was it about your dad that made him a great leader? And he said, well, my dad was a, a tribal leader in South Africa, and they used to sit in a circle. So there wasn't this hierarchical structure. Everybody was basically uh, at the same level. And the other thing he noticed was his father always spoke last. He, let, he wanted to hear everyone else's opinion, and then he spoke last. So during your next call, the tip here is uh, <clears throat> speak last. If you need to say anything, just ask questions to understand the team's perspective, but don't jump in with your own because ultimately it's going to influence theirs and that will diminish their voice and uh, their ability to provide value to the team. The other thing that individuals need is a mastery. They need to be working towards a sense of mastering the area that they're functioning in and we need to give them that. They want to work towards competence in their field. And one of the things that I highly recommend is training. Training that leads to certification. SANS, for example, it's, it's cost-effective way of really retaining top talent and giving them the sense of mastery that they're working towards mastering the, the area that they're working within. And what I would recommend that you do is put together an assessment of your team's level of mastery and then ask them to provide their own and, and try to look at the delta, you'd be surprised at the results. Sometimes it's not the same. So you might say, well, my team is already competent, right? They're, they're already uh, at, at a functioning at a high level. And, and the counter to that would be this concept of the illusion of explanatory depth, right? People tend to overestimate their knowledge and that the Dunning-Kruger effect is another example of that where they overestimate their, their knowledge of particular concepts. And then when you ask them to explain it, they can't. And the example here is these bikes that were drawn from memory. And as you can see, there were uh, folks who really didn't understand how a bike operates if you're, if you're drawing them that way. So the recommendation here is try to yourself explain a concept to someone that you think you know, and you will find that the illusion of explanatory depth is in fact real. Uh, <clears throat> touching on that in a little bit more depth. So leaders of high-performing teams not only encourage this level of mastery, but they facilitate it, right? And there's different levels. Ultimately, there's this unconscious incompetence where you don't know what you know, and that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. You tend to overestimate your knowledge level. And then you, as you, as you grow and you get some knowledge, then you, you, you know what you don't know, and you're getting that aha moment. And then you're at the point now where you're consciously competent, but it's not second nature. And once you get to that point where it's second nature and you've got that muscle memory, you reach unconscious competence, which is that level of mastery that uh, individuals crave. And the tip here is to build this muscle memory. Tabletop exercise, it was mentioned during the, the legal session, uh, panel session, is great is great and i think we need more of that to build muscle memory if we can have maybe more more frequent tabletop exercises and if you do have a red team and do purple team exercises that's even better to actually build the muscle memory so the their your team is at that level of unconscious competence they're not thinking about it they're just reacting and lastly purpose people need a sense of purpose in the work that they do they need to connect the work to a higher cause that's larger than themselves. And this drives the deepest motivation 
to, to use creativity to solve the most difficult problems, right? So how do we make members of our team care, really care about the work that they do? The thing that, the tip that, that I, I would want to bring to all of you is help them understand business objectives. At the lowest levels of the organization, un, help them understand what's the bottom line, how does the company make money, what are the services and products that we produce and who consumes them, and really give them a sense of understanding how the work that they do is impacting the bottom line of the business and then also the external customers that consume the services and products. And that really gives them a sense of purpose and meaning in the work that they're doing. All right, the Dunker Candle Task problem. And if you read uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, he uses this example. And I, I think it's super interesting. I'm not gonna go into much depth on it because of time constraints, but I do wanna really quick give you the, the sense of the problem. It's you, you were, individuals were tasked with pinning the candle to the wall in such a way that when it's lit, when the candle's lit, the wax drips, uh, no wax drips on the floor. So individuals were, were trying to figure it out. Ultimately, they tried different methods. They tried melting the candle on the side, sticking it to the wall. Some folks really got creative, but the solution was to use the box that the tax came in. And what was interesting is folks had difficulty with that because when they saw the tax inside the box, this concept of functional fixness set in, which is a cognitive bias that limits a person's ability to use an object in more ways than it was traditionally used. So they saw the box as a, a, a receptacle or a container for the tax as opposed to something that can be used to solve the problem. And the interesting part was that when there was a monetary reward for solving the problem, it took folks longer to solve this. So the, which meant that the creative process within the brain gets stifled when there is a reward mechanism, this carrot stick mechanism or model in play. And we really want to focus on cognitive flexibility and try to adapt our cognitive processes to unexpected conditions. So I want to pivot to, to data real quick. I don't think we can have a discussion on high performing teams without really talking about the value of data. And I think data is beautiful. Uh, I think high performing teams measure everything. You can't manage what you, you, you can't measure and what's measured improves. We've heard these terms before. Uh, I, for example, I, I enjoy playing golf and I've got sensors on all my clubs. And I get, I'll be honest with you, I get more excited uh, when I get home after a round to look at the data, to look at you know, what worked for me, what didn't, you know, how am I doing in, in the different uh, components of golf? And that, that, that sense of data and metrics, I think, is important to convey to the teams that we lead. And what I would recommend we do is task our teams with the goal of adding new data points, new metrics uh, every month or every quarter. And there will be some initial reluctance, but I, I promise it will be short-lived and, and people will see the value in the data, right? Oh, is it the famous quote? If we have the data, let's go with the data. If all we have is opinions, then let's go with mine. We've heard that, and I think it resonates with uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. The other thing is metrics, right? We've got data, there's data points and there's measuring, and then there's metrics that really tell a story that provokes questions and leads to actions. And I think during lean times, this becomes even more important because we sometimes have to justify resources and headcount and backfills and having data points that we can point to and say, hey, look at the team utilization here. We're actually over capacity and we can use data to prove that point and it can be effective. Strategy, and we're, we're coming, we're, we're almost done here, so bear with me. Strategy cannot overcome bad culture. And this is something this is the metaphor that I use for strategy. And I think a lot of us have heard of Peter Drucker's famous quote, strategy, uh, culture, eat strategy for breakfast, right? And I that resonates with me 
And the way that I look at it is in these images here. Good, this is good culture. This is bad culture. Right? Think of a vehicle. You might have the, the nicest brand new Lamborghini, but you're not going to get far with bad culture. And that's that's how I see strategy. It doesn't matter how great your your systems and structure and staff and skills looking using the McKenzie 7S. You're never going to reach your destination or it's going to be difficult. You might get there, but it's going to take a long time. You're going to lose people along the way with bad culture. And that's the style and shared values. So let's wrap things up. Here's some of the things, hopefully, that I was able to convey during this presentation that high performing teams are not necessarily motivated by the traditional models of motivation in terms of reward, and the carrot stick model, and that high expectations drives performance of Pygmalion. Think about that Pygmalion effect and that we should be looking for captains within our teams to develop. And the, the thing about captains is that it's not necessarily, these could be middle managers within the team. This could be team leads within an individual team. It's not necessarily high, the highest levels of the organization. So I want us to really focus on trying to develop, encourage, and ultimately believe in folks that have those values, those intangibles that, that were mentioned in the captain class. And then frameworks, the importance of the McKenzie 7S framework and how it can be applied to cybersecurity. And then rock stars are great, but they're in short supply. So we should try to be the leader that takes and turns B players into A players, right? And that we should be focusing on hiring people that have these intangibles, can-do attitudes. They're humble, they're hungry, and they have pride in whatever they do. And that with diversity comes creativity and new insights, neurodiversity strengthens teams, and see meaning and potential in the seemingly mundane and average, and pursue leadership and develop leadership within, within us for the right reasons, right? There's this quote from Sam Walker in the book on uh, the captain class. One of the great paradoxes of management is that the people who pursue leadership positions most ardently sometimes are often the wrong people for the job. They're motivated by the prestige the role conveys rather than a desire to promote the goals and values of the organization. And I literally interviewed someone once who was a team lead and wanted to go into management. I said, what is it about management that appeals to you? And he looked me in the eyes and he said, I like the power. Needless to say, I did not hire that person. And I did appreciate the honesty, but we need to think about why, why are we in leadership and are we really looking for the right qualities and traits for effective leadership? Now, as we close out this talk, my hope is that we have a renewed perspective on some of these concepts that maybe, maybe we haven't flipped them upside down completely, but hopefully there's a new outlook nonetheless. And I have one last ask of you, and that is to look at these partially covered letters and tell me what, what do you think they say? Post it in the Slack. All right, we've got some, some answers here, jumping to conclusions. And don't we do that all the time? Haven't we, uh, don't we have preconceived notions of, of talent and motivation and, and our biases sometimes kick in and conventional thinking about these ideas? The reality is, oh, and I can't move that. So, <laughs> So I was going to move the green box. There, there, these are random characters that don't say jumping to conclusions. You can look it up online, but uh, ultimately, uh, they're just random characters. And just as you hopefully saw meaning, you gave meaning to them. My hope is that you will find meaning and potential in the seemingly average and mundane, and that you will look at your teams and not see... Uh, not just see the potential, but develop it. And that you'll make those, you'll take those B players and make them A players. And that will appreciate the diversity uh, of thought, culture, and even neurology can provide that depth, insight, and cre creativity to all of us. Uh, and that ultimately caring and believing in people and giving them a path to mastery and purpose is not only powerful, but something that we desperately need during these difficult times. Thank you.